I imagine you might have thought we were going to talk about food and how we get hooked on bad food habits that we have difficulty breaking, but actually I thought we would start with something that's much more on everybody's mind, which is how to magnetize a baby. You start with a baby, the baby should be 9 to 12 weeks of age, and you sit face to face, 15 inches apart. You mix one teaspoon of sugar, one cup of water, and mix them together. Take the baby's pacifier, stick it in the sugar water, plunk it in the baby's mouth, and wait for three and a half minutes. When the timer goes off, stop. The baby is magnetized, and you may walk out of the room. Come back in about 10 minutes later with lots of other people, and what you discover is the baby ignores everybody. The baby looks only at you and gurgles and coos and throws you a seductive shoulder and is really looking at you quite adoringly. Now, what has gone on is that the baby's taste buds are set for the mild sweetness of breast milk. And you just applied sucrose, table sugar, to the baby's taste buds. And that triggers a nerve impulse that goes to the base of the brain and Opiate chemicals, cousins of heroin or morphine, are then released in the baby's brain. In turn, they trigger the release of another brain chemical called dopamine, and that is responsible for everything that feels good. And the baby was experiencing this while looking at you. And the baby now associates you with all things that are good. So this is obviously very practical for grandparents. Um, <laughs> it doesn't have to be your baby. You can magnetize anyone's baby. Um, Hospitals have been trying this, actually. If you have a newborn, I'm talking about one day of life or second day of life, and you're going to draw a blood sample, the typical technique is you take a little lancet and stick the baby in the heel and you get a drop of blood out. If you dribble some water in the baby's mouth beforehand, the, bi the baby cries just as much as before. But if you put a little sugar into the water and dribble it into the baby's mouth and then stick them, you discover the baby cries much less. What's going on here is that you're triggering the release of opiates which have a mild anesthetic effect in the baby's brain. And this has no effect, however, if mom was a heroin addict. And can you guess why? Because the baby has been bathing in opiates, of course, for nine months, and so your little bit of opiate that's caused from the release of the sugar has no effect. Okay? So, so the point being that sugar is essentially a drug. Not necessarily a terribly bad one or a terribly strong one, but it has drug-like effects nonetheless working through the opiate system in the brain. And when we are grown-up babies, this is the kind of sugar that we take advantage of, and we react in our own way. <laughs> well, does it matter? Well, a teaspoon of sugar has only about 15 calories. It's, it's not really a big problem. The problem with sugar, though, is that it gets into everything. It's easy to have large amounts of it piling up. And if you have one of these 20-ounce sodas, that can pack 250 calories of sugar that you didn't need. Now, when I was a kid growing up in North Dakota, we would have sodas every three months or something like that at a picnic or a, a party or something. It wasn't everyday fare. And I remember when the cans came in, <clears throat> our sodas were six-ounce bottles. When the cans came in, my mother would say, I can't finish a whole can of soda. <clears throat> I wish I had something that I could use to seal it up and save it for the next day. Well, today, if you go into any store, the smallest bottle you will find is 20 ounces. <clears throat> this is from, from um, Coca-Cola's nutrition analysis. 68 grams of sugar and almost as much caffeine as a cup of coffee. So if the sugar weren't a drug effect enough, the caffeine adds to it, and a 12 or 14-year-old kid consuming this is effectively hooked. This is from the Coca-Cola website. <laughs> that is a lie. Now, help me out here. T tell me if you spot an addicting food. If you see one, just go ahead and call out. Oh, okay, all right. Nobody called out for broccoli, I noticed. Okay. <laughs> Cauliflower, anyone? Well, okay, all right. This is my friend, Narcan. This is an opiate-blocking drug. A guy is shooting up heroin on the street, and he accidentally misjudges the amount. 
and he shoots up too much heroin and he gets wobbly and he passes out and his friends know what's going on. He's going to die. So they drag him into the emergency room and you find a vein and you inject Narcan, naloxone. It's an opiate blocker. What it does is it stops heroin from being able to affect the brain. So he wakes up and you've saved his life. Now if you gave this very same drug to a chocolate addict, I don't mean a person who likes chocolate, I mean a person who binges and is really throwing it down, you discover the most amazing thing. They take a taste of chocolate and they set it back down. They'll, they'll try it again and they just set it down. It tastes like chocolate, it has the mouth feel of chocolate, it smells like chocolate, but the appeal of it is largely gone. Now, by the way, this is not a treatment. <clears throat> if, if you wanted to do this, you'd have to actually have an IV hookup as you went to the 7-Eleven. But what it shows us is that we, the part that we are aware of is the taste. What is happening in reality is a brain effect in which opiate chemicals are released in response to that taste of chocolate, and that is why we are driven to it, especially at any time when you need a little anesthesia. If you're tired, if you're angry, if you're annoyed, if you're alone, we tend to turn to these foods, especially at that time. It's a drug effect. <clears throat> now, chocolate is not just sugar. A, a true chocolate addict is not going to be happy with a, a box of Domino sugar. Chocolate has caffeine in it. It has theobromine. In, have you heard of this? Anybody have dogs? Anybody have dogs? Okay. Did, did your vet ever say, don't give your dog chocolate? Theobromine is a mild stimulant for humans, but it can be fatal to dogs, and so that's, that's what's going on there. Phenylethylamine is an amphetamine-like compound that's in chocolate, it's in sausage, it's in cheese. And anandamide is the compound in the brain that is affected by THC. I'm talking about the active ingredient in marijuana. Anandamide is the brain chemical that's turned on by that. Chocolate causes that effect to persist. So chocolate isn't really a drug. It's the whole drugstore sort of wrapped up uh, all in one. Now, we recently did a research study. By we, I mean Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine, along with our friends at Georgetown University. <clears throat> and we had 59 overweight postmenopausal women who came into the study, and we were going to test the effect of diet on their weight. And we randomized them into two groups. One group got what you'd think of as a, a healthy, balanced American-type diet. No more than six ounces of meat per day, mostly chicken and fish, generally low fat. And the experimental group went on a vegan diet. Now, this was a new word to a lot of folks. They imagine vegans are people from the planet Vegas. <laughs> and we had to explain that this is different from ovo, lacto, vegetarians, ovo meaning eggs, lacto meaning, meaning milk. And once in a while I run into somebody who says, I'm, I'm pretty much vegetarian. But I do have eggs, and I have milk, and I have fish. And I have chicken sometimes. And I once in a while have red meat, but hardly ever. And I call them the ovo lacto pesco polo vegetarians. <clears throat> but anyway, this group was, this was a, a vegan group. They weren't vegans coming in, but we asked them to follow a vegan diet. And they did great. I have to tell you, they did wonderfully. After 14 weeks, we compared both groups. The vegans lost substantially more weight. Their waistlines trimmed down. Their cholesterols went down. We had a few people who were diabetic at the start. None of them were diabetic by any standard diagnostic test at 14 weeks. But I asked them, what do you miss now? And I thought they would say, I miss chocolate ice cream or a cold glass of milk with some cookies or a burger. And they didn't say any of that. Can you guess what they missed? They wanted cheese. They were waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning dreaming of cheese pizza with those strings of melty cheese coming down. And I thought, what is... And other people report that too. They miss cheese more than other foods. You know what I'm talking about. Anyway, I started thinking, why is it... I mean, let's be honest. Cheese does smell a little bit like old socks. Why is it that, that people want this stuff? Well, I started looking into this, and this is actually what propelled me on this quest to figure out about the opiate effects of foods that led to this new book called Breaking the Food Seduction. I found a paper in 1981 written by a researcher at Research Triangle Park in North Carolina. And he had found a substance in dairy products that looks very much like morphine. And he did a variety of biochemical studies and published in Science, the journal Science, in 1981, his conclusion that it is morphine. <clears throat> 